Hello, everybody. My name is Julio Tino. Uh, I'm the Dean of McCormick. Um, one of the most important issues in this year plus that we have been living through a pandemic has been making sure that everybody has the right support, the right structures, that people are connected, that they are able to function. And McCormick has developed a few programs uh, that are important to have, even in times of normal times, but they become even more important in these times of uh, the pandemic and have to do with helping people find the path forward uh, when the environment is so complicated and not everybody is the same. So I think what McCormick has is not the result of the Dean's office and my team is everybody is part of what McCormick is able to do. And that, I mean, the students are part of what we're able to come up with in terms of programs and initiatives. And in this second installment of the one McCormick, uh, we wanted to focus on issues that have to do with uh, mental health. And I thought it would be fitting to have some programs that were conceived uh, by us, especially Joe Holtreff, and we want to advertise this. We want to make sure that people know that these things exist. So with that being said, I'm going to let Joe and two accomplices that he has in this presentation to tell us what is involved in the program path. Joe, the screen is all yours. Great. Thank you, Julio. Let me share. You can see that. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here, Julio, and to talk about PATH. Uh, I want to start by just kind of giving you a quick outline of, of what we're going to talk about today. I want to spend a little time framing the McCormick challenges uh, that students are facing. Uh, I want to give you an overview of the PATH program, but fortunately, we have two students. We're very lucky to have two students, Megan Hollins and Nicholas Marchese who are here to kind of share their experiences as PATH uh, participants. Um, and, and so in framing the challenges, I wanna begin with uh, really the university's approach. Over the last several years, the university has deeply engaged in really understanding the, what's going on with the undergraduate experience. Uh, as evidenced by that, you can see that there are uh, a number of highly uh, involved uh, task forces and uh, committees that were formed to explore and dive deeply into the first year or, or the undergraduate experience. I've been fortunate to serve on several of these committees. And if you look at the findings of each of these reports, there are some common threads that, that really persist in, in each of the, the, uh, the, the efforts. And I would uh, highlight those as kind of a, an express lack of community, a number of students feel, feeling isolated, uh, no shared experiences or a perception that there needs to be more common experiences. Uh, NU culture is often uh, conceived to be highly competitive and there's been uh, students expressed a, a desire for more of a stress on balance. Um, and, and students are expressing a, a desire to help uh, build primary support networks that include faculty as well as peers. Overall, I think it's fair to say that the academic demands of the Northwestern uh, experience are, are found to be kind of a huge stressor for students. If I compare that to my own experience over the last two and a half decades, uh, some of the things that I see as persistent challenges that students report when I'm talking with them, certainly procrastination is at the top of the list. Uh, and that also is consistent with what we hear from our PATH participants. They self-identify procrastination as one of the biggest challenges they face. But I just wanna take a moment to explain that when I talk to students about procrastination, really what I see is that, it, that it's really two competing narratives. Uh, one narrative is the, this idea that it's impossible. I'm never gonna be able to do what, what's asked of me. 
And this other narrative is, uh, you know, uh, failure is not an option. <laughs> you know, let's burn the ships. And so Northwestern students, being as brilliant as they are, uh, have oftentimes find uh, a, a brilliant solution to an irreconcilable dilemma. Uh, and that is kicking the can, so to speak. So that's, I think, oftentimes the issue that procrastination presents. Uh, imposter syndrome, I'm always, um, I guess, a little surprised that no matter how students are doing academically, oftentimes they, they, they share this kind of internal voice that's convincing them that they don't really belong here. Uh, and that same voice can often lead to what you might, you might think of as shame cycles, uh, really, really self-critical talk that can often be experienced as quite brutalizing. All of these conditions had, had been mounting uh, to increased student stress, which, which even led recently, relatively recently, to a change in the university's withdrawal policy, allowing students to be, be able to in, withdraw from individual courses later into the quarter, which turned out actually was an, uh, one of the motivators for creating PATH. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But I wanna share one more, I guess, finding, if you will. And that is every year for the last eight years or more, we've been asking all entering engineering first year students to identify, uh, to answer the following question, which of these two statements best describes your experience in high school? My academics in high school came easily to me or my academics in high school were a challenge. Uh, and I, I don't know what you would guess, but I'll, I'll share that 70% of our entering uh, students self-declared that high school was easy for them. 30% um, uh, defined it as difficult. Uh, what I find also interesting is that this, this statistic has remained essentially uh, consistent over the entire length of asking that question. Um, and, but even more interesting is, who do you think does better uh, on average as far as GPA? If I could poll you, I, I suspect that most of you would say 30, you know, that this 30 percenters do better. At least that's the most common response I get, unless I'm talking to a 30 percenter, and then they usually say 70 percenters. But the answer is they do exactly the same in, in terms of GPA. And what's also interesting is that that uh, remains consistent across years up through senior year into a thousandth of a decimal point. And so what, what that to me is, a, is a, an affirmation of is that the challenges really aren't necessarily of aptitude or, or uh, skill. It's really about uh, you know, ability to adapt to this new environment and, and things like mindset. So taking that all into consideration, uh, about 14 years ago, we established what is the uh, McCormick or Engineering Office of Personal Development, which is, an, which is an office that collaborates with colleagues across campus to create and offer courses for credit that help students plug into themselves with an intention to help them manage themselves more effectively. So the first course was a collaboration with the, a colleague in the School of Communications and, and called Whole Body Thinking, Collaborative Problem Solving Through Partner Dancing. It's a, a Mindy Hop Swing Dance class. In 2012, we collaborated with CAPS, the Counseling Center, to establish the Emotional Intelligence 101 class, Managing Yourself, Maximizing Your Potential. In 2015, uh, we created the Engineering Improv Course 1 and 2, The Art of Allowing and the Art of Application, um, all again of, uh, with the intention of plugging students in to their physical sensations, emotions, and stories. And around that time is when the university was thinking about this change in the withdrawal policy. And, uh, and that led myself and my colleague, Heather Bacon, and, and uh, another colleague, uh, Liz Daly, to think about the PATH curriculum and create uh, the, the PATH curriculum as a response to students feeling as though they had no options but to withdraw from a course where they weren't sure they were going to succeed. Um, and so PATH, uh, quickly, as we were teaching PATH, we realized in order to expand it uh, or, or uh, uh, scale it in a way that, that would allow more students to take advantage of it, we needed to create what ended up becoming the online version of PATH, which was taught in parallel to the in-person up until the pandemic in spring of 2020. And so we were fortunately well positioned to transition to a fully remote PATH curriculum because we had the online PATH experience. So what is PATH? PATH is a, is a uh, sequential curriculum that students will take on their own but discuss in, in a group setting. Um, the underlying learning outcomes that we're really trying to achieve through this curriculum 
uh, you might recognize from the, the barriers I mentioned earlier. So intentional attention, healthy connection, self-compassion, uh, and stress management. Uh, and these are really meant to address these issues of procrastination, senses of isolation, that self-critical talk that often uh, is the product of perfectionistic uh, tendencies, and then anxiety that often results from poor stress management and leading to unhealthy coping mechanisms. So these were the kind of the key uh, uh, goals or learning outcomes that we really wanted to achieve, all of which was based on our kind of own philosophy of performance that I call the gears of performance. So I think we all have at various times an experience of, man, I meant to do this, or I wanted to do that, or I, you know, this was my plan, but I didn't, didn't uh, actually follow through or didn't experience you know, the success that I wanted. So how do we translate our goals or our desired outcomes to action? And I believe it's really through these three drivers, right? These three gears, psychology, biology, and strategy, or you might say how I think, how I feel, and what I do. So if we're just focusing on strategy, 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 we might have uh, patterns of thinking or some existing learning disability or, 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 or illness that we're not addressing in our biology that is uh, adding friction to the system of our learning, right? And so unproductive friction in any one of these drivers adds drag to the entire system. So our philosophy from the beginning was we need to find a way of addressing these three drivers in, in unison as a, as a system. And, and for that matter, if these gears aren't touching, if there's no friction, uh, we're quite literally spinning our wheels, right? We're not making progress. And so we want to recognize that friction is essential for creating traction and traction is essential for building momentum. And so that's really kind of an underlying goal of, uh, of, the, of the gears of performance in the PATH program. It was actually a student in crisis who kind of drew my attention to the similarities between CBT, which stands for cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy is an extremely effective therapeutic tool that a lot of our students will be introduced to, oftentimes in, in the, in, in when they're in the uh, throes of a crisis. So they might be uh, suggested or uh, encouraged to engage in an uh, intensive inpatient or outpatient treatment program Oftentimes, those programs really center around uh, CBT. And uh, you know, I was familiar with CBT, but when the students said, oh, I know all this stuff you're talking about in, in terms of the gears of performance, I was like, hold on a minute. This is cutting edge stuff. What do you mean you know this already? And this student said, well, it's just CBT. And then as I you know, kind of did more research into CBT, I thought, wow, there's some, some real similarities here. You know, so my ego was a little bruised, but I, I then realized quickly, this is a great validation for, for the, the, what we're trying to achieve and how we built this, this path system, um, you know, the, the, the incentive or the, the goals of a CBT program are more therapeutic. Our goals in the gears of performance are more academic achievement, but there certainly are some important parallels. So if we look at the actual curriculum itself, PATH is uh, made up of six modules. Um, and, and I wanna go through and explain how these modules kind of connect to our model of performance. You know, the students begin with a values assessment and a goal setting uh, activity. Uh, you know, kind of establishing uh, what they what they want to achieve this the, the quarter that they're taking path. So at the end of this first module, students will have three short term, academically focused goals that they will be working on. And this is important. In addition to that, they'll also have identified measurements that they will use to track their progress throughout the quarter. The third module is called how we think, and really is about mindsets, things like uh, fix versus growth, threat versus uh, uh, challenge. And that's really addressing the psychology, how we think and the impact that has on our performance. The third module is how our brain works. Uh, and that's the biology. We kind of go into what we've learned over the last decade or two in, in terms of learning science with the advent of fMRI technology. There's a lot more we know about how we learn that we can be leveraging in our strategies. And then you know, speaking of strategies, strategies, the gear of strategies is really kind of woven throughout the entire curriculum. And so as we're doing things like learning about attention training or mindset, we're also uh, including strategies to help students build and, and, and uh, maintain those skills. Um, the, the, the second and fifth module are attention training and self-compassion. Those really are concepts that, re that relate to all of the drivers of our performance, uh, the connection between our attention and our energy, 
and then the role of self-compassion in creating a climate or conditions for peak performance. And then once again, all of these are really in the, in the service of teaching our students how to take intentional and courageous action in service of their own uh, success. And then finally, uh, in the wrap up module, students, uh, the main thing that they're doing is they're invited to identify someone who they, we call it an accountability coach, that they identify, they can reach out to, they actually write a, a message, an email to that person asking if they will uh, agree to help them in the following quarter. And that's a great way uh, for our students to maintain their progress and continue to work on the skills they've been building. Um, you know, as far as impact, uh, uh, I'll show you one slide that, that uh, the first graph here on the left is a uh, uh, GPA improvement. So the blue bar represents PATH participants. And this is a comparison to the immediately previous quarter to their PATH participation and then the, the, the quarter that they were in PATH. So this is a, a, an increase in overall GPA that took place over the course of that one quarter. The orange bar are students who were invited to participate in PATH, but for whatever reason, weren't uh, able to accept or did not accept that invitation. So you can see students who participate in the PATH generally do better than those who were invited but didn't uh, participate. And then the, uh, the graph on the right is really more about persistence. Um, this is like, you know, are they, are they achieving better grades by you know, completing fewer courses? And this indicates that they're not. This is uh, the average uh, number of uh, quarter or credits that the, the PATH participants completed during their PATH quarter versus the previous uh, quarter. And once again, it's the blue bar participants, the orange bar are, are uh, uh, non-participants. And so, I want to end by just highlighting a couple of uh, key takeaways, key learnings that I think that we've uh, observed in the, over the course of teaching path. And first is don't underestimate the power of empathy. Uh, you know, it's so important to, to help our students feel connected. I mean, that really relates to a lot of the things that the university uh, task forces, you know, the studies have demonstrated this lack of this as isolation or, or failed uh, or lack of shared experiences. But in the course of that is if you're a teacher or, or an authority figure, share your own stories with students, particularly students, uh, stories where you've struggled, uh, maybe even or failed. Uh, those can be great ways of building empathetic bridges to students and, and to help them kind of feel more confident in the work they're doing. Students learn in different ways. Um, you know, when we ask our students at the end of PATH, and maybe Megan and uh, Nicholas will, will echo this, you know, we ask them, what was the most impactful thing? And they all have a different answer. <laughs> and so, you know, our job as, as instructors, as, as mentors, is to help students find their own uh, ways of learning and what works best for them. And then uh, a well-timed reality check can spark powerful insights. Uh, you know, this is something we built into the curriculum halfway through. We ask students, what's one thing you're still lying to yourself about? So don't be afraid to you know, challenge students to be in, uh, insightful. Uh, and lastly, self-compassion is a pragmatic approach to reaching peak performance. I think this is a way of acknowledging that you know, a well-timed uh, act of kindness offered even to yourself can be a really powerful tool in reaching and helping you achieve peak performance. And with that, I want to offer some special thanks to McCormick uh, information technology. Uh, their team was instrumental in partnering with us to develop the online path curriculum, as well as my colleagues, Heather Bacon and Liz Daly, who uh, were instrumental in creating the curriculum itself, the content. A um, uh, quick invitation to those of you who are watching who are part of the uh, Northwestern community, you are welcome to log in to PATH. This is the uh, email address down below. And uh, all you need to do is enter your NetID and password, and you'll be allowed to get into the system. And, and just as an update, uh, we are actually partnering with universities and colleagues outside of Northwestern. They're using PATH in their own uh, schools. Point Loma University, Nazarene University in San Diego has now made PATH a requirement of all of their nursing students in their first year. And Smith College is using PATH as the second year curriculum for their Ames Scholars program. Um, with that, I wanna uh, introduce Megan Hollins, a biomedical engineering uh, student who did PATH in the fall of 2019, and Nicholas Marchese, who is a material science major and uh, did PATH this past fall in 2020. And so with that, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to uh, invite uh, 
Um, Megan and Nicholas, uh, I'm going to host, let's see. Are we, I've got, um, all right, so Megan, and I'm, I'm going to ask uh, the first question. I'm going to get things kicked off. Uh, so again, at this point, if you do have questions you'd like to ask, Megan and Nicholas, just go ahead and enter them into the Q&A function. But to get things started, I am going to ask uh, each of you, uh, what motivated you to join the PATH program when you did? So why don't we start with you, Megan? Okay, great. Um, hi, my name is Megan. Um, well, I guess I'd gotten a lot of emails <laughs> probably like in 2018, my sophomore year about joining PATH. And I always thought like, um, I don't have time for this. Like I have extracurriculars that I have to do and courses are like piling up or becoming more difficult. Like I'm not gonna have time to do this. And um, the year that I ended up joining, I just thought to myself, like, what do I have to lose? Like <laughs> I really buy into this course that's gonna, that I get one, I guess, I'm spending time with other people who are in the same situation and have that hour set aside to develop my like studying skills and habits and things like that. Um, like, I feel like that would be beneficial. It's kind of like a, yeah, like I already said, like, what, what do I have to lose by joining this class? That's going to make me better, you know? Excellent. So we don't do damage, or at least that was your hope. Yeah. <laughs> Nicholas, how about you? Oh, yeah, for me. So um, back in, you know, fall of 2020, the nature of education changed quite considerably for all of us. Um, and, you know, before that, I, I was doing fine. You know, typically the way I go about my academics suddenly got completely derailed. Like usually I like go on campus and go to the libraries in between classes and, you know, work with people in person. All of that went out the window. Couldn't do that anymore. And, you know, the stars were aligning in such a way that my schedule was getting very, very intense for that quarter. So I was looking at it and kind of like, well, you know, everyone's kind of rhythm and cadence for just life in general kind of got, you know, derailed. So uh, I figured, well, why not just go and try this out and see what resources um, are available to me to try and uh, adjust and adapt to this. And I kind of think about it a little bit like going to office hours, like, yeah, okay, if I spend five hours on this problem, yeah, I might get through it, or I could go to office hours and spend five minutes with the TA or professor, get like guidance and resources, and everything could be a lot easier. So I didn't really see why I needed to struggle and suffer with this when resources were available to me. Outstanding. Excellent. One of the questions that came in is, uh, what aspect of PATH was most valuable to each of you? Um, so why don't you you want, uh, Nicholas, why don't you start with that? Oh boy. Um, so for me, it was just, again, like kind of having to, to start from scratch in terms of how I approach my academics. Um, in PATH, you're not exposed to one thing, you're exposed to a large variety of things. So for me, some things didn't stick. Like there was a thing where there were like, you plan your schedule um, like in detail every week. For me, that didn't stick. But for other things, sort of like it led to, okay, well, maybe if I um, write down my schedule day by day, because by the end of the week, everything has completely changed for me. But if I do it day by day, maybe that's more helpful, or maybe some things are completely irrelevant to me, but other things fit more. So it's just a, a large amount of exposure. And also, uh, I will say very quickly, a large amount of what I was exposed to path was from other students uh, who discovered things or uh, presented things. So it's not just from faculty or staff, like kind of like lecturing you and presenting you things. It's it's a group. It's kind of like a small community where other people kind of say like, hey, this is useful to me. Like, it's pretty cool. Uh, maybe you should try it out if you're running into these problems. Excellent. Yeah, so there's a real, there's a real camaraderie or, or shared experience. How about you, Megan? Can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, sorry. What uh, The question was, um, what aspect of PATH was most valuable uh, to you, I guess, what do you? Yeah. yeah, I think I just would echo what Nicholas was saying, um, more so the community factor, like having people that were in the struggle with you or like, oh, I'm not doing this alone. Um, and also I'm gonna sing Ellen Ward's all's praises because she's um, a like very impactful uh, teacher for this uh, course. I think that's that you're raising a really cool and interesting and important point is that this is a group uh, facilitated experience and so the facilitator is a great 
tool, I think, for creating that sense of, of uh, uh, teamwork and, and shared experience. Um, another question is, uh, how has uh, have things changed or how, uh, let's see, has there been something that you've drawn on more, even more now navigating learning in a pandemic? So are there tools that you learned that seem to be more relevant uh, to uh, uh, the pandemic? Megan, you want to crack at that? Yeah, I think um, one thing we learned about, or one thing we learned in PATH um, that was helpful to me was like um, resilience. And I guess I think of it um, in a way that I do when I play sports or like I'm practicing for a sport, it's really easy for me, to, like see an end goal to like practicing. But when it comes to academics, it wasn't as like easy to see. So one of the um, practices we learned was kind of like rewarding yourself for like completing tasks. And that seems kind of um, silly, I guess, but it is actually helpful. So I think, I don't know if that answered the question, but that's where my mind went when you asked. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the, kind of making connections to some of the things you are we were, you were already doing or leveraging to your academics. I like that. Um, how about you, Nicholas? Do you want to say uh, smile? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I was smiling because I actually have something that's somewhat similar to, to Megan's point, um, but in a different way. So one um, app that one of my uh, um, group mates uh, found, shared with us, um, I forget the name of it, but it was essentially like a thing where you, you put a timer and it kind of like locks your phone. Uh, you can unlock it if you want, but if you get through an end of a predetermined time period, which you set like an hour, um, then at the end of that, you get like a tree or a flower or something and you can grow like a little garden. And, you know, it's just cute little thing. But for me, it was useful as like a replacement of like, oh, this is my time at the library sort of thing, especially now that we're in front of our computers or things or phones all the time. It's so easy to get distracted. This really kind of simulated the library for me a little more. Cool. So, yeah. So I think that's one of the things that we do talk about is like finding those types of tools that work best for you. Uh, another question that came up is, um, it sounds like this has been a valuable experience for both of you. How do we share this more effectively with students? I, I don't know, or maybe how, how well, uh, how widespread is the awareness of the PATH and what, what are your suggestions about how to make sure more students uh, are aware of it and may consider participating? How about you, Megan? I think it might be helpful to introduce it maybe during Wildcat Welcome or something. Um, because like I said, I did it my junior year and that was like your GPA is set by then. But um, I think it might be helpful to introduce at that point. Great. Uh, Nicholas, any thoughts or? Um, kind of kind of hard because typically I would say like in tech would be a great way to put it, but then again, we're kind of remote, but we're kind of getting out of that. So maybe in the next coming quarter or two when things hopefully revert back to normal, maybe just posting it um, in tech because I know typically that's where I saw things when things were in person. The emails are working on me though, I will say that. The, the emails were helpful? Yeah, that's, that's how um, uh, I got yeah, although it. Drawn in my experience, it. it feels like fewer and fewer students read emails these days, but uh, I'm glad to hear that. Um, I, another kind of related question is, what advice would you give students who were uh, struggling or considering doing PATH? Why don't you start, Nicholas? Yeah, um, I guess I'll, I'll go back to what I said earlier. It's like there's, there's no downside to it. Again, I, I view it like office hours. If you're struggling, why not? It's a resource that's available to you. Um, you could spend a lot uh, longer trying to figure out yourself um, if you feel like you want to go that way, but it seems unnecessary in my opinion. Um, it really doesn't um, cost you much and it can give you quite a lot. And at the very least, it's I found it very useful to, again, like Megan was saying, have that community support. Uh, just a group to go to where you can just share your experiences and just check up on each other and, you know, then go into uh, a little bit more um, uh, application focus. Excellent. Excellent. Megan, anything you want to add? Yeah, besides just joining PATH, I guess one thing I've learned is to give myself grace. Um, and I say that in, like, we're getting a lot of assignments and 
like college getting harder based on like your years and as you continue to study but um just like reflecting back like you're human <laughs> you can only do so much um so like yeah when you're struggling in school give yourself grace ask for help a lot like people are willing to help and I think I think you're raising raising a really important point. I think that's what you get. Sounds like what you said earlier. Hearing other people's stories makes it easier to give yourself grace when you realize you're not alone. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, another question uh, came, I think, to me, which is, uh, how would faculty or staff point students to PATH if they think it might be helpful? Um, I would say they can do it by either directly contacting myself or or. Heather Bacon or Ellen Worstall with students they would recommend. And that happens. Uh, and so we would certainly invite those students uh, uh, along with the other students each quarter. Um, that is uh, kind of relates also to, you know, what do you, ex uh, to what extent do you use peer mentors in the PATH counseling program? I think both of you had Ellen as your PATH facilitator, right? But we have actually have had students who've been through PATH and maybe, I don't know, maybe what, what if uh, Nicholas or Megan, uh, you might get an invitation to lead a PATH group, uh, uh, but we have used students to lead PATH uh, groups in the past. And I think it's been uh, a successful model. Um, I think it's also, from my experience, uh, going through it in, as a facilitator is another way, I think, of reinforcing the, the, the learning and the, the tools. Um, we have one more question, and that is, what is the general impression of PATH among student body who have not participated? Have you reached out uh, to or recommended this to other students? Is there any skepticism on student body or people in general open to this approach? I think um, I'll answer that. I don't know if you guys, I mean, if you have uh, a sense of that, you're welcome to answer, but I would say I don't know that there's a skepticism. I think that um, oftentimes when we invite students, uh, they, it's probably just a lack of awareness uh, of the program. And so I think it's really an opportunity for us to do a better job of communicating the benefits. And it's, it, it is really, uh, I think it's, it's, it's something that's, val that's, that's relevant to all students. Students may, who might be experiencing academic struggle, which you know, as you go back to the slide where it's like, you know, was high school easy or was high school hard? It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, it's really about how you think about yourself in this in this uh, experience. And so, if you think, "Oh my God, I, I should be doing better," uh, then I think there's there's opportunities to uh, reframe the challenges and think more broadly about your performance. And, uh, uh, and and I think that can go a long way towards improving. But even the students who are doing great on paper, you know, academically. Uh, oftentimes are struggling the most uh, internally, that, that, that imposter syndrome, that, that sense of uh, self, you know, perfectionism. And so I think that's another outcome that we really want to focus on in PATH. It's not just improving your grades, but improving your overall well-being, how you're thinking about yourself, balancing your, your, your priorities and making intentional choices is another way of I think, healing uh, and uh, being more productive. Thank you. Great questions. Okay, we're reaching the ending here. I wonder, Megan and Nicholas, if you have any parting words, but thank you so much for helping us. Well, of course. As uh, I said, we are only as good as the collective system is, okay? Uh, yeah. You, uh, are the ones, you are the ones who make us good, okay? <laughs> Yeah, in terms of, of parting thoughts, kind of just following um, up on what Dean Holgrieve just mentioned, uh, yeah, I, you don't necessarily have to be doing poorly or performing poorly academically um, to start PATH. You can use it as a sort of a proactive thing, um, mm -hmm. whatever reason. Maybe you have like, I don't know, a, a course of like five very uh, hard classes in an upcoming quarter or just like you know, again, pandemic hit, and you're not necessarily suffering now, but a lot of things have changed, and you don't want to uh, be in a bad place before you get help. You want to prevent yourself from getting in a bad place in the first place. So you don't need to be actively suffering already in a bad spot to get help from Pat. Great. Megan. I don't have any parting thoughts, but thanks for inviting me. <laughs> well, glad, glad to have you here. 
Joe, you can say goodbye and great job, all of you, as Amy has shown us. Thank you, and thank you, Megan and Nicholas. I think you, you're far more uh, articulate than I uh, in, in talking about the benefits of the program. And uh, I hope uh, we, it continues to grow and benefit students for a long time to come. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Joe, Megan, and Nicholas. Thank you, bye-bye. Thanks, Julio.